Hi, this is Jim Cunningham, and today I'm with Janice Lee Shen, and uh, we're going to talk about what do I do if I suddenly become a successor trustee, and we do have a special guest here as well. So this is a disclaimer. This is not legal advice, okay? This is uh, information only, so don't watch this and go out and do a bunch of stuff. If you're watching this live, we are doing this live on, on Zoom. Please join one of our Zoom webinars. We do them every Thursday at noon Pacific time. If you're not watching this on Zoom, go ahead and click, click subscribe to our YouTube page and click the little bell and you'll get a reminder when uh, we post content. And we got we post content pretty much every week. We have office locations in Northern and Southern California, kind of the Bay Area, Sacramento capital region, and uh, the sort of LA, um, LA Orange County region. These are attorneys and Janice is one of our certified specialists in estate planning, trust and probate law. And I've known her for many, many years. And uh, these are the other attorneys in our firm. We're dedicated entirely to trust and estate matters and family wealth planning matters. So we're not doing like divorces and car accidents and all these other kind of random things. And I am the CEO and partner at Cunningham Legal. I've got over 25 years experience. We help, attorney, uh, help clients in other locations, other states than California. And I'm a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot, single engine land instrument rated. So if your pilot's out there, I'm actually a third generation pilot, which is kind of cool. Second generation lawyer. We have Janice Lee Shen. Janice, welcome. How are you doing? How are things? Great. Hi. Wonderful. And then we've got David, who'll be David McMahon will be joining us in a few minutes uh, when we uh, cover how to split up the personal property. So a lot of people they say, look, the money is kind of easy, but who gets, you know, grandma's china or whatever it is, or or who gets in my family, who gets the rock? that grandpa brought back from Greenland in the 1930s. It's actually true. So what do you? What do I do if I suddenly become successor trustee? What do you do? Something to understand. This is just really basic information. Trusts are controlled by trustees. Soldiers serve in the army. Sailors serve in the Navy. Trustees are in control of trusts. Executors are in control of wills. Agents are in control of durable powers of attorney. They're all performing a similar role. They're all essentially, in, within, in our context, a fiduciary role, but we give them different names. So when a lawyer says trustee, the other lawyers and judges, they know, okay, there's a trust if there's a trustee, an executor uh, for a will. And when someone is named as trustee, when someone who's named as trustee stops serving as trustee, this successor trustee takes over. So many times you'll hear us talk about the successor trustee. Well, the successor trustee is typically not the first trustee who is serving in the trust, but that successor trustee later becomes trustee. So we don't, you know, if I create a trust and I name Janice um, successor trustee and I die, Janice then becomes trustee. She loses that successor title. So successor means that you're kind of down the road when other trustees don't serve. A trust protector, we've got great content on our YouTube page about what a trust protector is. And a trust protector can appoint a trustee. A probate court judge can also appoint a trustee. I would say um, a lot of attorneys do not use trust protectors. I think if you're a lawyer watching this and you're not using trust protectors in your state planning practice, you should probably take a look at it. For those of you who aren't lawyers, yes, we do get a lot of lawyers watching these. And um, <laughs> this is really important. And Janice and I are going to talk about this a lot. And, and Janice focuses most of her day representing people who are successor trustees. Once you assume the duty of successor trustee, there are a whole bunch of duties and responsibilities that follow from that. Okay. So the 13th amendment prohibits involuntary servitude unless you're incarcerated. Okay. This is a, a constitutional amendment that abolished slavery. You're not just because someone names you as trustee, you don't have to serve as trustee. You can decline to serve as trustee. But once you pick up that mantle, there's a whole bunch of responsibility that comes with it. One thing that we'll be repeating is that you are personally liable. You're 100% personally liable for every act you take or don't take that you should have taken, right? If you're trustee. And too often, I think people who are named successor trustee have no idea what to do. All right. Again, trustees, uh, Trustees are 100% personally liable. And here's something you need, also need to understand. A trustee must not only follow the terms of the trust, but there are a whole bunch of other laws and regulations that a trustee also has to follow that aren't in the trust itself. So this is why this is not something you should be doing alone. Now, I think some of the biggest mistakes that we see, that Janice and I see, and I'm, I have this, I, if you're watching this, 
this graphic of red asphalt, which was the movie that I think all the kids, this is slightly before my generation, but if you grew up in the sixties, I think there's a picture of a pickup truck that literally was my truck, but it was white when I was growing up. Um, failing to consult experts before you take an action is a huge mistake and failing to consult the experts before you refrain from acting is probably the single biggest mistake you can make short of essentially like stealing the money and you know gambling it away. Um, so we're going to go over all the stuff you shouldn't do. We're going to go over all the stuff you should do and how to do it. And we're going to keep you from stepping in it. And um, figuratively, we're going to show you how to put on your seatbelt and drive safely, right? Because if you're a trustee, there's a lot of danger out there. Now, you're not putting your, your body in danger so much as you are your, your assets. Potentially your liberty, if you steal, people do go to court or good, do go to a prison if they embezzle. So something else to understand, there are no trust police, okay? There are no cops out there saying, ah, you can do this or can't do that as a trustee. There's very little guidance, very little guardrails. So six big rock issues, what we're going to talk about today is what is a trustee and what is a beneficiary? What happens when somebody becomes incapacitated? So again, the example, I, be, I set up a trust, I named Janice as successor trustee. Uh, what happens if I have a stroke? Uh, or I get hit by an ice cream truck and I'm, and I'm not able to serve as trustee. We're going to talk about what happens when someone dies. We're also going to talk about when and whether to hire professionals. Because sometimes, you know, if it's really simple, and we have one example, you may not need to hire a lawyer. You may not need to, you may not even need to hire a CPA. But these are kind of extreme examples. I would say the vast majority of the people we interact with do should be hiring a professional. We'll talk about duties and liabilities and record keeping. So... Um, do you want to explain what a trustee is, Janice? I'm here. I'm doing all the talking. What's a trustee? What's a, what is a beneficiary? So a trustee is someone who is going to manage the trust assets. The trustee is not always the owner of the assets and the trustee is not necessarily the beneficiary. The trustee can be. And so sometimes when you are a trustee and you are a beneficiary, you really have to watch out and make sure that you're bifurcating your hat and making sure that your roles as trustee and beneficiaries are completely different. Yeah, I mean, that's really, uh, you raise a really interesting point because many times people who are watching this, you know, you might be watching this and say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to be the trustee and I've got two, I've got a brother and a sister and my brother is such a jerk. I'm really worried. Like once I start doing this, he's going to be all over my case. He's going to give me a headache. Like, well, this is kind of, kind of scary for me. Something to remember, when you're a trustee, you're a fiduciary, that's fides from Latin, meaning faithful. You have to put the interests of your jerk brother before yours, okay, as trustee. So um, beneficiaries get the goods, bene from Latin gets the goods, and trustees are uh, in charge of everything, but the beneficiaries get the economic benefit. So it's not the trustee's money. So if you're a trustee and you're watching this and you think, I'm wielding all this power, that's not your money. You're in charge of it, but it's really the beneficiary's money. So this is very important to understand. Fiduciaries have duties. Beneficiaries have rights. Beneficiaries can enforce their rights through court action. That is typically how they're enforced. So fiduciaries, they have to do a bunch of stuff, and the beneficiaries can sit back, and they can be the critic, and they can say, well, trustee, you know, you didn't do that right, and you didn't do that right, and I think I should get more money, and I think you should be personally liable. The beneficiary doesn't have to do anything, okay? So Beneficiary is kind of along for the ride on this. So it's very important to understand that if you're the trustee and the beneficiary, you have to be extra careful, okay? Because you can't put your own personal interest uh, before those of, of somebody else. So uh, something important to uh, also understand, Janice, this comes up a lot. Somebody says, my jerk brother filed a court action. That's a contest. The, the trust says, if, if my brother challenges this trust, then he's disinherited and doesn't get anything. That's not always the case though, is it? I would say most yeah. court actions aren't a challenge to the trust. They're actually seeking many times, at least uh, this is what they say, they're seeking to enforce the trust. So trustees can't be jerks. Just if you only remember this, trustees aren't allowed to be jerks, but beneficiaries, Janice, we see it, they can be real jerks. So Gail creates yeah. a Gail Trust and names Tammy trustee for the benefit of Betty, Gail's daughter. So G. Gale is the grantor. That's the term we use in our firm as creator of the trust. You can also use settlor trust maker. Tammy is the trustee and uh, Betty uh, is Gale's daughter. So Betty's the beneficiary. Tammy's a trustee and Betty's a beneficiary. It's not Tammy's money again. It is Betty's money. So mom sets this up and doesn't really trust Betty to handle the money. So she names Tammy her friend 
And even though Tammy controls the purse strings, uh, it's not her money. So maybe if you can tell us why people stop serving as trustee, Janice. So in terms of a trustee, so originally when the trust is set up by the grantor, typically, not always, the trust maker, the grantors are the trustee. And so really the ways that um, the trustee can either resign, decide, I want to retire, I want to focus on other things. Um, the trustee can be removed for bad um, faith or for reasons in terms of bad conduct. Uh, the trustee can um, become incapacitated. And so we would have to look at the terms of the trust to see what and how that is defined because every trust is a little different. Some trusts require two doctors to sign off, some uh, trusts require one doctor to sign off, and some trusts require a disability panel. So every trust is a little bit unique. And then some people choose um, to, um, like I mentioned, resign, or some people don't have any choice and fortunately they pass away and um, death causes the successor trustee to then become trustee. Yeah, and something really important, there's, a, there's a, a new law that's effective this year. And what that law says is if, you know, in, in, in my case, if I create a trust and I become incapacitated and Janice becomes trustee, Janice has an affirmative obligation to account to the people who inherit from me when I die. Let's say it was my wife and three kids. She has an affirmative obligation to account to those people while I'm alive before I die. So this is this is a new thing in the law. This was in case law. And the way law works, California is a codified system, meaning the state legislature passes laws. The courts interpret those laws. And sometimes law comes from the court decisions. And then the legislature adopts what the court has decided in the, in the probate code. And that's where you find the rules for trusts. That has been changed. Effective January 1 of 2022, there's a new set of rules that heap more responsibility onto the trustee. So again, this is a reason why you don't, this is not a wing it, do it yourself uh, type of project. You really do need to engage with, with experts early on, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's say any capacity of the person who created the trust, Hal and Wanda create a living trust. And uh, they, of course, they name themselves as trustees. And then Hal and Wanda get hit by the ice cream truck and become incapacitated so they don't die. So they're crossing the street and, you know, whammo, they get hit. Um, Daisy, their daughter, is named as successor trustee and accepts the role. Not only must Daisy, and I mentioned this earlier, not only does Daisy have to follow the terms of the trust, but there's a whole bunch of other rules and regulations that are in the probate code, which covers trusts, and there are also a lot of case law. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that Daisy has to do. Even if she follows what is written in the trust, she may not be doing her whole job. And that's really important to understand. And this is case specific. You know, the challenge, Janice, I think with, with law is law is a practice. And so there, there are rules and laws and cases and a client comes in and they say, this is our situation. We have to apply those laws and rules to a given situation. And that's, that's really the value that lawyers add. Um, and we help keep our clients out of trouble. So it's very important to understand, even if Dave, Daisy follows the terms of the trust, to the letter, she may not be doing the full job, okay? So let's talk about, just maybe riff a little bit, Janice. I mean, what what do people have to do? Like, let's say Daisy here with Hal and Wanda, Hal and Wanda get hit by the ice cream truck. What does Daisy have to do? So Daisy needs to locate all of the beneficiaries, and that's typically obviously listed in the trust documents. She has to um, print out the trust document and actually either mail it or serve it up, up, upon the beneficiaries. You can't email it. I have a lot of clients say, I just emailed it. No, you know, the law is actually against that. We actually have to physically print the copy for the um, beneficiaries. And so sometimes it's even difficult to figure out who the beneficiaries are, especially um, here in California. Um, we have a lot of blended families, so we have to determine who are the beneficiaries. And so, you know, we have to look at the trust to determine, do I just send a copy to the children of the grantor or do, does that also include the grandchildren? So again, depends on the actual trust document. Yeah, so that's why you need to talk with a lawyer. You know, if your parents get hit by the ice cream truck and you're dealing with stuff, uh, you need to check with a lawyer because again, this what Janice is talking about, is there are these other rules that say you have to do this stuff and it's not in the trust itself. So this trust is part of a complete process, but it's not 
the all it's not the four corners of the process, right? So there are other things that you have to bring in. Um, I would say just kind of getting a handle on the assets, something that maybe people don't fully understand. If it's Hal and Wanda's trust and Hal and Wanda are the trustee and they stop being the trustee, Daisy needs to take title. Daisy, trustee of Hal and Wanda's trust. And that's a process you go through. And that does require a new certificate of trust. And um, that's something you do with a lawyer. So the certificate of trust, you might be hearing a little bit about that. And taking control of non-probate assets or, or non-trust assets. So if Hal and Wanda have an IRA, many an IRA or 401k, many times the person who's named a successor trustee is also in charge of those assets that are not in the trust. And IRAs, 401ks, uh, annuities, life insurance are not in the trust. And then also, of course, making medical decisions. So you get hit by an ice cream truck. There's a lot of medical decisions to be made. Many times the person who's making the financial decisions is also um, named to make the healthcare decisions. So change your mailing address to Daisy's address. Notify the law firm. That's really like one of the first things you should do is, you know, if, if an attorney wrote this estate plan, um, call that law firm, right? Call our firm, call a lawyer, right? Somebody. Uh, many times though, what I will tell you is many lawyers do estate planning later in their career. I started doing estate planning when I was 25. Many lawyers start when they're 50 or 60 or 70, and they're about the same age as their clients. So if Daisy's parents are in their eighties, that lawyer could be retired, dead, might still be in practice in their 80s, right? We don't know, could possible. But um, you might have to find another law firm is where I'm, where I'm going with that. But you do need to consult with a savvy lawyer. And this is important, Janice. We see this a lot about last minute estate planning because sometimes you can do estate planning even if people lack capacity, which kind of sounds weird, but there are things that you can do um, to maybe help uh, with the situation. Many times people come in and they have an outdated estate plan. I would say if your estate plan is more than five years old, absolutely take a look at it. If there's been a death, a birth, a divorce, um, in, or a marriage, you definitely need to look at your estate plan, even if it's not been five years. And then also you need to contact the physicians to get letters evidencing their incapacity. Check in with your other members of the A-team, which is the financial advisor and tax preparer. Also investigate any federal or state benefits. Typically there are disability benefits if somebody's been working and they can no longer work and um, record the documents to show that she's the trustee over real property. So what happens, uh, Janice, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Let's say Hal and Wanda, they create a trust, it's like a bucket, you take your assets, your, you know, your, your house, your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds, you, Hal and Wanda put them into Hal and Wanda's trust, but how do you do that? And then they die and Daisy's the trustee, what is it that we do as lawyers for people when people stop becoming trustee with respect to property? So it's really important. It's, it's, it's funny that prior the prior slides you brought, brought up the trust police. Um, typically, there's no trust police, but the beneficiaries um, become the trust police in their mind. And so what when a trustee actually needs to go on title or needs to be um, taking control of the account, what the trustee should not do is just transfer everything to his or her name. That's considered commingling. That's considered a breach. So what the trustee needs to do is to inventory all of the trust assets, whether the asset is held in the trust name, and if the grantor is still alive, it's even more important for the trustee to contact us because there are a lot of things that we could avoid in the future in terms of court petitions, probate. Um, so in terms of the incapacity trustee, the trustee should definitely um, inventory the assets and actually transfer um, the title to his or her name and figure out through as trustee and also determine what the correct trust tax ID number would be. And that's something that our firm um, can definitely assist you with. Yeah, and then also getting um, making sure that all the insurance has uh, the trustee or the trust as an additional insured. That's very important because one thing insurance companies like to do is they like to say, oh, you didn't dot that I or cross that T, so we're not going to give you any money. Uh, meet with an accountant as early as possible to establish a record keeping system. Folks, this is critical. Do not wing it. Okay. Many times people they're living their lives. Hal and Wander living their lives. They may not have a robust record keeping system for their own stuff. If you're their trustee, you absolutely have to have that in place. If you don't, you're running a real risk of having some pretty big personal liability. Uh, <laughs> do not make loans, gifts, or distributions for anyone other than Hal and Wanda. Okay. So a lot of times what people do is, you know, 
Daisy's taking over for Hal and Wanda. And then her brother, Bob's like, Daisy, I'm, I can't make my rent this month. Can I have 10 grand? Can I have 20 grand? Come on, mom and dad are not going to make it anyway. Just give me some money. No, don't do that. So death. Let's say Hal and Wanda are hit by the ice cream truck and die. In, in these stories, someone always dies, Janice. I don't know. So there's a lot of other stuff that you have to do. And this is really important. So when somebody dies, you have to do all the stuff we talked about, but there's even more stuff you have to do. You have to figure out if the person is married or single. If a person is married and dies, in this case, Hal and Wanda both died and they were married, okay? You have to look at um, marital versus separate property. That should be community versus separate property. And whether the trust splits into various trusts or not. And typically you're going to see this AB trust structure. So if you're watching this, and you're what, because you're thinking about your parents or maybe you, and you're like, I don't know what kind of a trust they have. You really need to be really pay attention to this. Janice, kind of walk us through the two different kinds of trust, the trust that split and the ones that don't, and, and how important it is to figure out what's separate in community property. So it's interesting because a lot of the times when clients come to our office, they either want to restate or amend or change their trust or they're just starting out fresh. So typically when a client comes in and they want to either redo their trust, um, the rules back in the 90s, even early 2000 are completely different um, as compared to today. And so the main reason why trusts in the 90s were set up as they were, how they were was that it was essentially what uh, the trust, the trustors wanted to avoid estate tax. And so for that reason, the older trusts have a provision that says that upon the death of the first spouse, the trust actually has to divide. The assets need to split into either two or three different trusts. The actual asset also needs to be retitled. Um, and so a lot of the older trusts have that provision. And so again, it was it was good back then, but you know, it's very important if you have a trust in the 90s, early 2000s to come see us. Um, the newer trust, again, depending on the family situation, if the family situation is what I consider plain vanilla, where uh, it's a husband and wife, um, what happens and, you know, if one person passes away, could the other spouse change everything? Could the other spouse um, give everything to his or her new spouse? And so in terms of the two major differences, that's really important. And that really comes to play when somebody passes away, we need to figure out how the serving spouse, or in this case, um, if uh, both spouses are deceased, what the trustee needs to do in order to avoid any further capital gains tax or estate tax issues when there was a trust split required. Yeah, and, and what Janice is talking about is, you know, it used to be that you could give $600,000 tax-free to anyone you want, and anything above that was taxed at 55%. Now you can give $12,060,000 per person. And it's taxed at 40% on amounts over 12 million, 60,000. Well, for the vast majority of people, they're not paying any death tax. But if you did your trust in the 90s or before 2011, and really the cutoff date's 2011, if you did your trust then, you probably have a structure that says, thou shalt divide your estate. If you're married, thou shalt divide your estate into two halves. If you're both living, if Helen Wonder are both alive and both healthy, it is very easy to change this. Well, easy, it, less cumbersome to change it. If one has passed away, and we've met with many clients, Janice, many people, they've come in, we look at their situation and we say, look, you have a $2 million estate, your kids are going to pay $500,000 in capital gains tax when they sell those assets after you're gone because you have this AB split. So what we do is we go to court and we take that away. We, we dissolve that. Now, there's something called portability. Since 2011, a spouse can now inherit the death tax exemption. This is a coupon that 12 million 60,000 thing, we're in 2022 this year, 12 million 60,000 per person, the surviving spouse can inherit that 12 million 60,000 dollar coupon and add that to whatever they have. And that was kind of what that AB trust structure used to mimic. But now that the government has changed the rules and lets you inherit that from a spouse, you don't need that AB split anymore. And so that's why we really recommend to our, our clients, um, they really reconsider that uh, if they have it in their plan. Now, if a person's unmarried, it is not necessarily less complex, okay? There's just different complexities. So um, I would say this, you know, we, Janice and I talk to a lot of people who lose their spouse. 
it's always traumatic. It's always, sometimes it's shocking. And i just think of so many situations that have just really been, they just, they're heartbreaking um, to see the pain that people go through. People have been married. I suppose some people are happy. I mean, maybe, but I, most people are just sad to lose their life partner, someone they love. Um, it's a very difficult time in their life. We get that. I mean, I totally understand that. Um, but make sure that you take care of yourself first. Okay. It's like, you know, when the oxygen, if, if you lose cabin pressure and the oxygen comes down on a Southwest flight, put the mask on first, you need to take care of yourself first. And if you're caring for a surviving spouse, make sure you take care of that person. That is your number one priority. All this other stuff, frankly, is secondary. Um, but also remember a lot of these tasks don't have to happen right away. They can wait, but there are some deadlines and, you know, there's a nine month, you have nine months to file for that portability, um, death tax exemption, maybe a six month extension. You should notify the immediate family members. Um, however, you know you want if you want to notify a couple of people who then call a couple of people if it's if it's a difficult time for you. Um, and also, if you're uh, if the decedent is a business owner, you're going to need to get on that pretty quick. I know with dentists, they have to have closed their office within 30 days, or the government closes it in California, because I believe it's because they have scheduled drugs there. So that's just a random thing that I found out during my practice over the years. So. Lots of stuff. I notify the funeral home. The funeral home typically notifies social security. I would, how many death copies of death certificates, Janice, do you recommend clients get? I would inventory the uh, account, real property, all of the assets that the decedent had. And I would probably get the same number of death certificates to match that. Yeah, because you, you, a lot of people don't know that when someone passes away, you have to remove the deceased person's name. Well, how you do that is you send the death certificate to the county recorder so that they know it's legit. I mean, that that's how you prove up someone's death is that that certificate, that piece of paper. Uh, locate the important papers. Um, if you uh, if it's electronic, it's got to be real a lot harder. I think we're still Janice in this era where a lot of people have their stuff printed out, um, so it's a little bit easier. But think about that. If you have everything electronic, you got you have to have a process in place so that other people know how to access your records. Uh, change a mailing address is 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 pretty pretty uh, straightforward um, and is is common. Also, you know, getting a lawyer early on. You need to get a lawyer early on to determine if you need to hire a lawyer. Okay, it's kind of like if you say, "Wow, I have a pain in my chest. Uh, am I having a heart attack?" Well, what do you do? You don't just like try and self-diagnose on WebMD. You go to the doctor because you might be having a heart attack. Same thing here. You might not need a lawyer, but you might. And the only way you know is to go to the lawyer. So uh, if this is a really big takeaway from this is check with the lawyer, have that initial consult. I would say most of the lawyers who know what they're doing, they might give you a few minutes free just to see if you know it, it's a good fit. But when you sit down and you have that typically a one hour consultation, that should be a paid engagement. You should pay the lawyer for the lawyer's time. And the lawyer will tell you, these are really helpful, aren't they, Janice? Because I know we meet with people and there may only be one meeting and it may be an hour meeting and they're good to go. For other people, they may need uh, to continue on with the engagement. Um, and it depends. This is sort of asset specific. Affidavits of death of trustee, new certification of trust. A certification of trust is like a two page version of the trust that says the trustee is the trust. So if you go to the bank and you have to change the title to the trust, right? So Helen wanted to die and Daisy's coming in and, and she's the trustee. That Daisy just gives them the two page document. But in the real world, Janice, we know the bank wants them to fill out their own certificate of trust. So that's the world we live in. Uh, and uh, for a surviving spouse, uh, new powers of attorney, typically you want to remove the deceased uh, spouse's uh, name. If any part of the trust becomes irrevocable, Janice mentioned notice to beneficiaries. Trust can become irrevocable when a person becomes incapacitated. So under California law, that trust is an irrevocable trust when the person who made the trust can no longer amend it because of incapacity. So it's very important to understand. Uh, again, delivering paper copies of the trust, notify the financial advisor and tax preparer, very important. And if you're employed, if the person's employed, notify the employee benefits um, office, because many times, and we saw this with, um, I had a client, an Amgen employee uh, in Southern California, they had stock options, the vesting accelerated at death, and they also had accidental death insurance as well. So definitely, if a decedent is employed, contact the, the HR office and find out uh, what benefits there are because you, you know, as trustee and think about this as trustee, it's your duty. You have to do this, right? This is not just, this is not optional. And if you don't do it as, as, as Jenny said, 
The cops in this story are the beneficiaries. They're the one who are going to take you to court uh, if you're the trustee. So um, actively take over management of the trust property and again, notify the professionals. All right. What not to do? <laughs> so what we've seen. Uh, what we, what yeah, what seen. It's, almost, it's almost more important than what to do. So the, <laughs> talk about number one. Um, do not transfer any assets. I think that a lot of people, you know, a lot of trustees think that they could handle it on their own. And so what they'll do is I had a client where that trustee cashed out an entire IRA, had no idea that you have to pay income taxes on it. So do not withdraw, roll over any annuities. Um, definitely don't do that. The second, do not make any elections, again, 401ks or IRAs, because there's income tax consequences. And also with the new laws regarding IRAs, we want to make sure that the beneficiary that is receiving the IRA, they might apply for one of the exceptions. So for example, um, when a child or a beneficiary, or excuse me, someone who's named as a beneficiary of the IRA is now receiving that IRA, that beneficiary can ha have to take out everything within 10 years. Now, what if that beneficiary is planning to re retire in Nevada in year eight? And so it's really important to speak with uh, a CPA, um, our firm, to figure out what makes sense in the long run. Great advice. Uh, great advice. Uh, we mentioned portability. Uh, I touched on this. It's a coupon. You can leave 12 million tax free. This is a big freebie, folks. If you're married and you have a spouse die, absolutely consider filing for portability. Here's why. We don't know what the death tax exemption is gonna be in the future. Well, we do in 2026, it's gonna get cut in half, okay? It's going down to 6 million. We're going through an inflationary cycle. Who knows what it'll be? Who knows what your assets will be? But we may have a different uh, result in an election and that exemption could go back to a million or 600,000. And the tax rate could go up to 77%, which is what it was in 1973. This is subject to change. The federal, um, uh, the Internal Revenue Code, when it comes to death taxes, estate taxes, the stated purpose of the federal estate tax is to redistribute wealth. Look it up. It's in there. That is the reason this was passed. It was to take money from wealthy people and, and give it to the government. That's the only reason the death tax exists, okay? That number can change over time. So. This is due two years. It's due nine months with a six month extension, uh, 15 months. If you go past that 15 month um, extension, too late. B trusts, we talked about it back in the olden days before 2011. We used to recommend B trusts. Now we don't because there was a $5 million exemption in 2011 and another one we got in 2017, plus an inflation adjuster on both of those. That's how we get to 12 billion, 60,000. And B trusts have this little hidden aspect of capital gains tax creation, if you will, and it can be eliminated through um, going through a court petition to terminate the B trust. We have a lot of content on this on our website. I encourage you to take a look at it. So when should you hire a professional? At the beginning. Mom dies, have the funeral, call the lawyer. That's really the first call you should be making is, is to the lawyer after the, you know, after the, you arrange for the funeral service and, and you talk to the, um, uh, the funeral home and, and social security and all that. And I will say some people, it, I understand this. Some people say, look, well, this is really simple. I think I can figure this out. I'm not a stupid person. Mom and dad wouldn't have named me as trustee if I didn't know what I was doing. There is a poor person mindset that is very difficult to shake off because you say, look, mom and dad only had a million dollars, whatever it is. I don't want to pay people. And how much does trust administration cost? It's about $10,000 on average. I, I talked to a lot of lawyers for a normal trust administration. Now there's a big range, but that's kind of, you know, it's kind of like how much is a car? I don't know, 30,000, right? How much is a trust administration? 10,000, kind of same, same, um, same logic. But this is, is very important because some people will look at that and go, oh, that's a lot of money. That's a waste of money. This is absolutely not a waste of money. This is keeping you, the trustee, out of hot water. If you do a bunch of bad stuff, you can be stuck with that bill personally. You're personally liable. Um, and again, this poor person mindset, it's tough to shake off because you look at this big number, but a million dollar estate and a $10,000 bill is a 1%. That, I mean, come on, that, it, that's a very low amount of fees to pay. What's interesting, Janice, I think you can see this, sometimes the smaller the estate, the more complex the issues. And we'll talk about that with David. 
and the splitting of the personal property. Uh, the more beneficiaries there are, the more complex it is. And you know, if your your widowed mother passed away with ten thousand dollars in the bank, living on social security, not filing a an income tax return, I don't think there's much there. There, uh, Janice, that might be like a fifteen minute call where we tell the client, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, don't even make the hour appointment with us. Uh, and then there is the hot topic in many families because money is easy to divide, right? If mom and dad have 3 million bucks and they're three kids and the kids get a million bucks each, pretty straightforward. But what about the stuff? So David, if you want to join us, turn on your camera and your microphone and um, let's talk about fair split. You and I spoke I've known you for many, many years, and you and I spoke a yeah, long right. time ago, and you and we went through a trust administration. Yep. And you're like, how do we split up the stuff? So tell us what fair split is and and how you help people. So fair split was something I uh, I wanted to create um, as a as kind of an invention, if you will, an idea that would help people solve a problem. And I thought back to when. Um, things were painful or what problems have I had in my own life that would have been helpful to resolve. And, and one of them is who gets the stuff after someone passes, because it's usually referred to in the will or trust. If it's referred to at all, it says divided equally among the kids. Uh, oh, and, you know, give this painting to Sarah, you know, maybe there'll be one or two things that's actually addressed. Everything else is divided equally among the kids. And Jim, you and I've talked about how this actually can become a lightning rod because oh, yeah. the, yeah, be, because the other things are not um, uh, really negotiable. They're usually pretty well defined in the trust or will, who's going to get what. So this can end up becoming the area of, well, he may have gotten that, but I'm going to get this. And so it could actually become the flashpoint of family discord. Um, more often in our services, um, so basically our, our company is designed to list, share, and divide the stuff. And that's the furniture, the rugs, the jewelry, the artwork. Um, and there are lots of ways people have tried in the past, these post-it notes, the red, green dot, uh, okay. blue dot, the uh, dot. system. I love yeah, the dot system. God, I, you, and well, you can, what we're talking about is like the, the little bird Hummel. My mother-in-law yeah. had Hummels before she yeah. passed away. Okay. Uh -huh. The red dot is for Roger and the green dots for Gary kind of thing. Right. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, whichever is the least attractive sometimes on the holidays, that brother will move the dot to his other, <laughs> to the other one as a kind of a gag. Yeah. So you can't really rely on that system as much as uh, one would hope. So, so what I would say though, is not only, um, uh, did we create this to avoid conflict or to, yeah. to help resolve situations with conflict? For most people, we tell them, look, there's no reason you should be good at this. You've probably never had to divide the stuff of a family, your own family or other, ever in your life. So why would you, why would you be good at, at it? So uh, we created a system that kind of walks people through the process of how to create full disclosure, full transparency, and have everyone involved equally. And so by doing it online, it, it, it also takes down the overwhelm. It takes down the need for people to be in person in front of one another, which can set off extra yeah. emotional charge. Yeah. Um, we become the independent third party, Jim, that attorneys, uh, probate officers, executors, trustees will sometimes choose to have us just run this process for them. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry. What you're, what's interesting is, uh, you know, losing, uh, losing a loved one is, has a very complex bundle of emotions. And yeah. I know when my mom, when my grandfather passed away, that was the second of my mom's parents to pass away. She said, I'm an orphan. And she was like 50 some years old. I was like, what are you talking about? It's just weird. There's a weirdness to it. And then to heap on this weirdness of dividing up the personal property, because money, you know, I think my, money once, money goes from mom and dad's account to my account or to, to anyone's account, it becomes mine and it loses its, its, um, its separate identity as not being mine. But when you inherit that, I mentioned that rock that my grandfather mm -hmm. brought back from Greenland, right. like who would fight over a rock? Well, I'm an only child, so no one's going to fight, but mm -hmm. who would fight over that? Well, that could be really sentimental. It means something beyond the tangible asset. And I think it's overwhelming because a lot of times these are family members and who has the energy, who has the time? You know, you think of all the stuff you need to do in the world. I got to go through mom and dad's crap, for lack of a better term, 
and, right. and figure out what gets uh, thrown away or whatever. And it also can happen during lifetime. So I know when my in-laws moved out of their house, they downsized and exactly. they gave away a lot of stuff. And frankly, a lot of stuff, they don't, they don't watch. She, my father-in-law doesn't watch these. No one wanted it. I mean, I hate to say it, but, um, but these are very valuable things to individuals and, and people didn't want it. So tell us why online is better because I agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. Just in my own personal yeah. in-law situation, it got highly emotional, highly emotional. Right. Um, we'll kind yeah. of like that. So, so one of the things I would say about online, well, first of all, online was impossible 20 years ago. My, you know, when I started this company, Jim, you, you actually know my wife from the past too. And she said, man, you, oh, you're taking on something big here. You're trying to change behavior, uh, not just create a, a better mousetrap. And, and I, well, what about, what was that behavior? Well, the behavior is since the caveman days, everybody met at grandpa's cave and split up the spears and tools. Uh, it's kind of been done the same way until now the internet makes it possible that no one actually has to fly in. People, families live further apart now. They're, they're not all living locally. Uh, when people living into their 80s, their kids are sometimes in their 50s, 60s when, when they pass. So they're in peak uh, career years. They don't have time to jump on a plane and go walk around the house and draw straws. But just the ability to uh, have everyone see the same things. Um, sometimes... Uh, sometimes spouses create an extra issue. You know, you've got the heirs. Well, maybe there's a, a the wife of one of the brothers that nobody can stand or the, or the over overbearing brother-in-law that nobody wants in the room. Well, all of a sudden it's going to go off the rails just because they're there. And so uh, by having it online, it just creates a, uh, a neutral playing field. And then, you know, by engaging fair split to, to help with the process, we help keep them out of some minefields. Like, you know, a lot of times the older brother is the executor. Mm -hmm. I had a situation where the older brother just went through the kitchen and he said, you know, but he wants this crap and he donated it all. Well, there was the cookie jar. There was mom's uh, teacup and sugar bowl that she used and the sisters were livid with him. My guess is they never spoke with him again. I mean, they were so angry that he um, disrespected what they saw as valuable. Yeah. And you know, you, you're mentioning something, um, and I, I was watching an episode of um, like Hoarders, you know, the TV show. Oh, yeah. Actually, and they had yeah. a psychologist on there. No, no, this was a Malcolm Gladwell thing. He said oh, okay. some people attach, they have to have a tangible object to trigger a memory. Yeah. And so, for, so this is something, if you're watching this and you're, it's your job to split up the assets, please don't forget that. You right. may have somebody that there's just some little object that you never even thought of, but that's really important because, you know, mom may have passed away and that little thing is going to remind your sibling of mom, you know, forever. And, and that's something that I think if you take that memory away, and so this is why people, these hoarders resist getting rid of stuff is because literally you're stripping them of their memories and, right. and to a large extent their identity. So there's a lot more here than stuff. It's, I think it's the story behind the stuff. So how do people... Um, how do people use fair split? What, what would be the next step if somebody's looking at this? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. But a lot of people, we, we actually, you can create a free account and, mm -hmm. and, um, upload the photos, list everything by the room, invite your family members. Everybody can log in. You could get on a zoom call like this. You could draw straws, take turns choosing. Yeah. That's completely for free. And we just decided to do that because we actually, we do want to help. We, we want to help with the process of, um, uh, and, and the challenge of otherwise is you can create these kind of awkward spreadsheets and email them to each other, but then they're too big if you put photos and then you're using Dropbox to match up photos. And we thought, look, we've already built this system. Let's let people have access to it. If they then want to use us to uh, list the items from the photos, if they want us to, if they want to use our, our um, uh, round system, mm -hmm. and that's you know, really easy. It's yes, no round. Does anybody want any of this? So look, there's 500 items and there's three kids. There's usually at least 200 of the items nobody wants. So that way the executor or trustee knows, okay, we can move these over to sell or donate. The remaining items, we have two division rounds that can be used. One is called the emotional value round. And that lets everyone get points to bid on things. They're, they're not bidding money against each other, but they each get say 500 points and they can put those points on, say, five items. They could put all of them on one item. If that, if mom's sugar bowl was the only thing they wanted, they might put all of them on there. 
but if they put points on three or four items, everybody's going to probably get two or three of their most emotionally charged. Hopefully, I get that item. I, I sometimes call it dad's ukulele round. Uh, the ukulele, ukulele is not worth anything, but somebody just has to have it. Um, and then the final round really works more like you would expect uh, if you met and drew straws. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very similar to um, a fantasy sports draft where everyone, if we put 100 items in the round, any of the ones you're interested in, you slide from the left column to the right, and then you organize it top to bottom, your top choice to bottom. If there's three kids, we recommend a random order and we go one, two, three. Three, two, one, one, two, three. We take the top item remaining. Oh, it's like person. a draft pit. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, it, it, we take the top item on each person's list as we go back and forth across. And what's nice about that is everybody gets their list together, uh, puts it in the order they want. When the round ends, the software calculates everything instantly. It awards everything to the people who wanted it. And it's just a, a more efficient, faster, uh, neutral way to divide things. You know, as you're talking, I'm I'm so thankful you did this because I think this is where the genesis of a lot of conflict. My dad's a retired lawyer and he practiced family law for many, many years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had a case, it was a divorce case, and I, you, you have to use this in divorce. They had an exchange and he remembers getting a four page letter from a lawyer arguing why the toilet seat should go to the other spouse and not my dad's client spouse. And he was like, you got to be kidding me. A toilet seat of all and things. A, and a four page letter is an expensive thing. To <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> well, David, here's your contact information, fairsplit.com. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us here today. And uh, thank you, Jim. Appreciate before it. Before Fourth of July, have a great Fourth of July weekend. You too. All right. See ya. All right, so that was fantastic. Uh, duties and we'll round it out with duties and liabilities and um, responsibilities, and then we'll um, and then we'll cover the questions. Uh, Helen wanted to create a living trust. They get hit by the ice cream truck. Not again. Not only must Daisy follow the terms of the trust, but she also has to follow statutes and case law. And I think this is where people trip up. This is pretty obvious. Although Janice. Um, some people don't like this first duty. <laughs> you have to follow the trust as written, right? That's- Yeah, I mean, just like the emotional attachment to the personal property items, some beneficiaries have an emotional attachment to their childhood home. Mm -hmm. And so it's sometimes, the, uh, a lot of times, a beneficiary just won't leave because he or she just does not want to leave their childhood home. And definitely, you know, the trustee has a duty to um, consider the other beneficiaries because you can't have a beneficiary just uh, a beneficiary live in the home rent free because that means that you're really favoring that particular brother or sister. Yeah, Janice, that's a great example because I think this is one we see. This is probably the most common breach of trust, and it's it's related to ghosting which for those of you who are not millennials, ghosting means just not responding to you. And we, this is a very common call. Hi, Jim. Mom and dad died three years ago. I stopped talking to my brother two years ago, and he's still living in mom and dad's house, and he won't return my phone calls. He won't answer the door. He won't respond to my letters. He won't respond to my email. What do I do? Well, that brother is breaching pretty much every duty. Okay. And if that's you, you're going to be personally liable, ultimately could be personally liable if a court finds you. And again, it's the police in this transaction or the beneficiaries, they go to court and that's, that's how that, that works. It's important to deal impartially with beneficiaries. And this can be especially difficult. And, and when I said that trustees have duties uh, and beneficiaries have rights, beneficiaries can be jerks. And they really, Janice, I don't think they have much of a there's no penalty of being a jerk, is there? They're just <laughs> like, I'm it. just enforcing my rights, right? I'm just enforcing my rights, but they can be real jerks about it. Um, this is really important. Don't use property for your own benefit. And you know, don't sell the family home to a dollar to your kid saying like, oh, I'm going to get an end run. Obviously, a dollar is a low price, but you, know, you might have a million dollar home and say, well, I'm going to sell this home for 700,000. That's called self-dealing. That's to a related party. 
you're going to be held liable for the difference between the market value and the, va the, the value that you sold that property for. So don't do it. Also, um, using money for your own benefit is embezzlement. That is a crime. I have had a client who embezzled estate funds. She went to jail. Okay, so you can go to jail. I didn't know about it when she did it. Just full disclosure. It's in my book, <laughs> Savvy Estate Planning, which you absolutely should get. This is on the estate planning side. Second edition's out. So make sure you get that. You can get it from our website. Um, you have to take steps to enforce trust claims to property. If the trust is owed something as, as the trustee, you're, you have an affirmative obligation to go out and get it. Um, and if there are two trustees, you know, one cannot be totally along for the ride and the other trustee has the entire laboring oar on that one. You know, both, both have to do it. And you have to apply any particular skills you have. So if you're a CPA and you, you know, you're a kid serving as trustee for your parents and you're a CPA, you're required to use your special training. Um, this is really important, especially right now. As we're talking, I think we might be in a bear market. We might not, depending on which index you look at. You need to understand this as trustee. You're 100% responsible for everything, everything bad that happens. Remember, the beneficiaries get the goods. The beneficiaries get all the good stuff that happens. The trustee is responsible for all the bad stuff that happens. So this is sounding like a pretty bad deal. If you're listening to this, you're like, well, I don't know if I want to be a trustee. Now, you are personally liable for every asset that goes down in value during the administration of a trust in the absence of an investment policy statement or, or memorandum. This is really important. Now, I know, Janice, we talk about this with, with each client that comes in. Some clients say, I don't want to waste money. And again, this is this poor person's mindset. They say, I don't want to waste money on hiring a lawyer to do an investment policy statement. They don't take that long. But this is a tremendous shield, especially right now, because there is a built-in time delay. Uh, Janice, do you want to talk about that? So somebody dies. These things don't administer themselves. You have to have a trustee. And how much time do you have to wait before you make, make distributions? So typically when the trustee becomes the trustee, it doesn't matter whether the trustee figured it out 60 days, 90 days, there are statutory requirements to notify the county, to provide a copy of the trust. So I would say when, when you know you're the trustee or someone tells you, hey, I'm gonna name you as a trustee, say, by the way, please provide me a copy of the business card or email me the name of the attorney you use. I, I need to know where the actual trust document is um, so that when the trustee, you know, actually becomes a trustee, you, you know, you don't want to wait. You, you don't want to assume that, oh, just because I didn't really know or no one gave me a copy of the trust, you, it's an affirmative duty. So yeah, ignorance and, is not. And that may be six months and markets can go up and down in six months. They can go up and down in six days. Uh, so here's some really bad things to do. Uh, failure to maintain, conserve, and protect trust assets. You got to, you're, you're in charge of all that stuff. Borrowing or investing trust assets for your own benefit. Again, embezzlement. Paying yourself excessive trust fees. Those vary by county. My understanding is Napa, the 1% a year is fine. You go to Ventura County, they're going to be asking you for a uh, basically a computation of your hourly involvement. The situs of the trust or the location of the trust is where the trustee lives. So if you're administering a trust for someone who lived in, in Los Angeles uh, and the trust was created in Los Angeles and you live in Napa County, you're going to be under the Napa County rules. And there are 58 counties and 58 different sets of rules. So it's uh, clear as mud. Failing to address, address, invest trust assets prudently, uh, it's a biggie. Um, not making distributions to beneficiaries when required by the trust. If somebody gets a specific gift, a dollar gift, here's, I'm going to give Johnny $10,000. Johnny gets 10,000 when I die. You have to pay that 10,000 within a year. Otherwise you have to pay interest. And that's statutory. You have to pay interest. I'm not rendering an accounting to the beneficiary. And accounting is like a big um, um, bank statement, you know, starting balance, all the money that came in, all the money that went out. This is what's left over. It all has to add up. Typically that's done with a lawyer and a CPA, but sometimes just the lawyer. But uh, CPAs do accountings differently than lawyers do. And it's important to understand that the probate code rules diff are different. Probate code covers trusts. That is different than an accountant. The accountant will say, well, can't I just use QuickBooks? No, you can't because that's not what the rules say. Um, also incurring penalties on late uh, gift or estate taxes. The penalty for filing a late return or paying late is 5% per month. 
up to 50% on a death tax return. Record keeping, you have to account to beneficiaries. Everything has to add up. And here's some tips. Think about an interest-bearing checking account, even if it's low, although interest rates are coming up. Keep your account separate. Now, Janice, do you see people just lump all the money in? They go, oh, it takes this. I'll just put it in my account. I, I'll just, I'll, I have my own personal account, but I'll just say this is trust money. Bad idea. It's a no-no. That's a no-no. Even with, we definitely see that with property. And then I just had a caller say, well, we just transferred everything to my name. And so now they're, they're getting a supplemental property tax bill. It's, it's a mess. So definitely with accounts, definitely with property, do not do that. All right. Well, this brings us to the end. We have a few questions. Uh, we do have our blog. Check out our website. We got a lot of great blogs. We have a uh, how to choose a successor trustee on our website. And the link is in the notes on YouTube. Uh, very important to take a look at that. Here's my book, Savvy Estate Planning. Second edition's out. This is the book you need to read before you go to the lawyer. Whether you come to our firm or go to another lawyer, no matter where you are in the United States, this is not California specific. Um, this is all the stuff you need to think about before you go see the lawyer. Check out our YouTube page. We got a lot of content, a lot of great content on our YouTube page. And um, go ahead and, and click the subscribe. If you are watching this on YouTube, here's how you contact us. You can go ahead and click that orange button. Uh, that's how you um, schedule an appointment with our firm. And if you like what we're doing, please review us on Google. We really appreciate that. And I will, let's see if I can pull the Q&A up here for some reason. It's kind of hiccuping. Huh. Let me just pull the Q and A. Well, okay. I just can't move it on my screen. Technical difficulty. And I, I did, guess I did update my software. <laughs> Sandy asked, do I need a copy of the trust? Yes, if you're the trustee, Sandy, absolutely you need a copy of the trust because you have to follow the terms of the trust. Here's the deal. There is a statutory will. You can go to the uh, online and get a California statutory will. It's a form. There's a California statutory advanced healthcare directive. There's a California statutory uniform statutory form power of attorney. There is no uniform trust form, living trust form, okay? So it, you, you do need a full copy of the trust. Uh, the parents have a living trust with the two children as successor trustees and beneficiaries. The trust states that the children are to act jointly. Father is deceased and mother cognitively incapacitated. The parent's bank will not allow the children access to the parent's two safe deposit boxes unless one of the children, children resigns as successor trustee. Apparently, the bank has been sued by one successor trustee when giving access to deposit boxes and to the other successor trustee. Suggestions for dealing with the bank is neither successor trustee wishes to resign. Um, now, this is anonymous. What you can do is ask the bank if you can have a trust officer inventory the, the safe deposit box. That way you can see what's in there. So what the, the idea is both trustees go in, the bank officer's there, you turn the keys, you pull the box out, you open it up, and you inventory what is in what's in the safe deposit box, then you put it back in. At least then you'll know what's in there. Um, Janice, I don't know if you have any, if, if that's what you'd recommend to clients. I mean, they're kind of stuck. I, I probably don't know what, which uh, financial institution that is, because I'm literally dealing with this. So assuming the trustees can't, are, what, if, if one is out of state, unfortunately that, that person has to fly in. Um, so assuming both trustees cannot be there, you either need to look at the trust protector documents because you need to give the trustee independent powers, um, worst case scenario, court action. However, court action is not that difficult. It's the formality. And if you have a competent attorney like ourselves, it's really standard practice. And so I would recommend that. Anita asked, will you address which events require originals and not computer copies? I would say when you're selling real estate, that's uh, actually though, I don't know that anyone ever asks for an original of the trust. Janice, have you seen that? No, not recently. We have not. Um, it only occurs if there is a contest in terms of the yeah. uh, you know, and is in place. But originals, you really don't need um, so much nowadays, except the will. You oh, do oh, that's need different. to look the original will. Anonymous asks, is amending an AB trust such that the surviving trustor may disclaim an interest in the family trust a reasonable way to bypass the requirement to fund the B trust, even though this is not preferred compared with restating the trust to get rid of the AB language? Um, anonymous, that is correct. So what you're talking about is funding a B trust, a bypass trust through disclaimer. Uh, I think I've had one client fund it with a disclaimer, frankly. People don't disclaim. Put this into context. You've just lost your spouse of 50 years. 
and you have to disclaim within nine months, which means you have to give something up. You just lost your life partner. I think it changes your brain and you're just like, I'm not, I'm not letting anything go. I'm keeping it all. So I think there's a very human side of that, but the short answer is yes. Uh, thank you for your book, Savvy Estate Planning. Um, <laughs> Although I was disappointed to read in your opening page that I can't bring my fishing rods with me when I die, as I had hoped that would be at least negotiable. Well, anonymous, <laughs> no one's been able to do it yet. Um, so uh, Pete says, how could I not trust people who are sitting in front of halos? I think it was one of the uh, uh, cartoons. Do you have to give a copy of the trust to all beneficiaries when you become trustee if the beneficiary requests? So the rule is it's probate code 16061.7, 16061.7. If a trust becomes irrevocable, um, you have to send a copy of the trust to the beneficiaries. Now, Janice, I don't know what you do in your, there are two sides of estate plan. I focus on estate planning. Janice focuses on trust administration. If someone gets $5,000, do you give them a whole copy of the trust if they're not an, an intestate heir, right? So if it's like, a church and they get 5,000, are you giving the whole copy to the church? They have an entire, yes, they are entitled to the whole copy. They are not entitled to a full accounting though. So they don't get to see all the numbers. Um, I would like to add the beneficiaries can differ from the heir at law. So yeah. just because a child um, is not a beneficiary receiving any benefit from the trust, that child by blood is entitled to a copy of the trust. When uh, the trust becomes irreversible. Apparently, Wells Fargo was the bank with the. Um, I'm sorry. I to cannot, hear that. Even if you get, if you're watching this and you work at Wells Fargo, you're probably like, oh God, not Wells Fargo. So anyway, how much? To, and we have nothing against Wells Fargo. It's just they're these big banks are difficult. How much uh, time does a trustee have to complete the accounting? Uh, and a, a trustee must has 60 days to complete an accounting, and they can be uh, asked to provide one every six months. If you have a trustee who has not rendered an accounting, you need to ask for an accounting in writing, typically through a lawyer, and they have 60 days to say, I need more time. And typically they'll say, I need more time. And then you file your court action and a month later or six months later or nine months later, and they, your courts are using COVID as an excuse, you might have a hearing. It might be a year before you can compel an accounting is where I'm going with that. Uh, brother died in Maine, sister lives in Virginia. I'm in North Carolina. So brother died in Maine, sister. All right. My sister applied to be personal representative. I signed approval. Only valuable asset was his house, 30,000. Her, our attorney said accounting, not necessary. Does that mean I won't get any kind of explanation of how the sales proceeds? Uh, the house is pending sale. I think um, the short answer is probably yes. If you waive an accounting, I think you're probably still entitled to information. But if you waive the accounting, you know, I, I would defer to your lawyer on that one, but I think you could at least get like the closing statement from escrow. I think that's a reasonable thing to provide. Um, Joel says, hi. Hi, Joel. Um, another great seminar. Thanks. We're all done. Jamie says, uh, and this is the last one, do, the last one. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in. Jamie says, does a trust always become irrevocable when the grantor becomes incapacitated? Jamie, great question. That trust becomes irrevocable under law not under the terms of the trust. So when a person lacks capacity, that trust, even though it says it's revocable, is irrevocable. I hope that answers your question. So again, this is where like the law, um, again, there's a lot of rules that apply to stuff. Can beneficiaries sign a waiver if they want to, if they want to, and the trustee did not ask them to sign? Uh, waivers, uh, I I'm gonna say yes, but here's the thing, under California probate code, once a beneficiary waives an accounting, that person can change his or her mind. So 30 days later, you could withdraw a waiver. So that's where it gets really great. All right. Well, that wraps it up for questions. Thanks, Janice, for joining us. It was great to spend time with you. And thank you for watching. And make sure to go ahead and hit the subscribe button on our YouTube page. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Okay.